Well, next up, straight away, uh, we have a conversation with a, another leader, um, and quite related, I would say, um, in that Frank Cooper is the chief marketing officer of BlackRock, the largest institutional uh, investor in the world. Um, and certainly the conversations that we've had uh, this morning around climate and sustainability are directly uh, impacted by BlackRock's own decisions and statements earlier this year, where BlackRock became uh, a major leader in the fight for, uh, you know, against climate change. So welcome to the Signal Stage, Frank Cooper. Thank you, John. Great to be here. You know, this morning's announcement from P&G certainly is significant, um, and it's aligned with an announcement that BlackRock made in January. It feels like it was a decade ago, given that it was before, before the pandemic reached the shores of the United States. Um, but back in January, it made significant waves. Can you give uh, the audience who may not be familiar with BlackRock's, uh, you know, announcement and work uh, a little bit of detail uh, and framing around that? Yeah, sure. So um, every year in January, uh, Larry Fink, our co-founder and CEO, writes a letter to all the CEOs of the, of the portfolio companies uh, in which BlackRock invest, and and we're the largest investor in in, uh, in most public uh, publicly traded companies, um, and and so there's a lot of influence behind that. So over the years, Larry has focused on long termism. He's focused on diversity and inclusion, um, but over the past couple of years, it's been mostly about purpose. And in in January of this year, January 14th, uh, he announced that um, sustainable investing and environmental sustainability will be BlackRock standard. We're going to hold uh, uh, portfolios accountable uh, for advancing uh, efforts in environmental sustainability because we believe one thing. We believe that climate risk is investment risk. And uh, and that really was the link for us um, to, to make it core to what we do. Uh, and we've been active in doing that. We recently, uh, in fact, two days ago, released a investment stewardship report that indicated our voting record, but also how we're engaging with companies so that we can encourage them to to head down the path of addressing climate change and becoming more sustainable in their actions. Yeah. Now, for those uh, who are in the audience who may not, you know, understand exactly how, you know, there are teeth involved in this, you mentioned your voting. Um, can you can you unpack that a bit? How as an investor in public companies, do you have an impact on the actions of boards, management and, and corporations at large? Yeah, because we, we hold the shares um, and we act as a fiduciary. So so first and foremost, we hold the shares on behalf of our clients. Um, and um, but we are representing the clients and we think it's in their best interest that the management of these companies are looking out for the long term interest of their companies. And we believe there are a few things that we believe are, are in, uh, in alignment with the long term interests of the company. You know, we believe that uh, environmental sustainability is certainly one of them. And so. Every year, we have an opportunity to to vote, and um, and we don't just show up uh, at the time of voting. We show up frequently uh, with uh, companies' leadership, and we explain why we believe um, things like diversity on, on boards is important, and, and why that actually creates long term value for the company. Uh, we explain why we believe taking certain actions uh, for environmental sustainability actually bolsters the the. Uh, um, the performance of the company long term, and uh, and then ultimately we have to make a decision about how we're going to vote, um, whether we're voting um, you know, against certain board members, um, you know, or we're voting uh, in support of or in opposition of certain proposals that come before uh, the company on an annual basis. And so we're increasingly using our leverage, um, both in terms of engaging with these companies, but also um, voting, and uh, and we're being more transparent about both. Uh, I'll tell you, John, historically, we tried to um, handle a lot of this behind closed doors um, to yeah. try to encourage management to do the right thing. Um, but, you know, the expectation of people, if you look across all the stakeholders, including employees, employees, customers, uh, communities, um, they're, they're, the expectation now is that the company and in investors should be transparent uh, about their actions, 
And so we're embracing that. We think it's a good thing. Uh, and if you look at our most recent investment stewardship report, uh, it demonstrates that we are uh, we're very open about how we're approaching some of these issues. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned uh, more than once a, a phrase that, that I'm fond of, which is long term. Um, uh, however, I think it's fair to say that the mantra on Wall Street for the past few decades has not been long term. It, it, as a matter of fact, it has been quarterly results, short term focused thinking. Uh, and there are any number of practices across uh, Wall Street and corporate America that have bolstered short term thinking. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, how do you square what is traditionally understood to be the Wall Street, you know, North Star, which is make your quarterly numbers, drive profits for shareholders, and that's it, to long term thinking, multi stakeholder approach? Those two things seem pretty uh, opposed. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's, there's a definite tension there, um, and and that's why I mentioned Larry's letters um, because the the long term perspective is necessary for all of this to work. Um, but the good news is this: there are increasingly more investors who believe that the long term value is the play they should make, um, both in terms of they're investing their values because they want to see a world that that um, is improved uh, through the investment, but also they believe it's it's the um, uh, a better way for them to generate returns. If you look at just what happened uh, with sustainable investing during the the COVID nineteen crisis, you know most of us, many people, thought that you're going to see um, investors kind of flee from sustainable investing um, because there was this underlying feeling that in the short term maybe sustainable investing is not a great return. But ninety percent of the sustainable indices outperformed their parent benchmark during that period of of, of time. In fact, we're seeing such resilience. That has been one of the drivers of growth for, um, for BlackRock and for, for many investors uh, coming through this period. So I think there's an awakening among investors, at least a segment of investors, that um, uh, the companies that are pursuing uh, sustainable strategies will be stronger in the long term. But we're increasingly seeing, seeing that even in the short term, that's true. Um, and, and, and John, I, I tell you, when I saw the P&G announcement, I was really motivated and encouraged by it because... Um, now, to me, it, it it demonstrated courage, but more important than that, it demonstrated what purpose-driven leadership looks like today. You know, where your actions are going to be louder than your your words. You're going to set very specific goals and very specific actions with within a uh, within a, a definite time period. And I think when you start to see companies like P&G lead the way, that gives other companies permission uh, to follow. And, uh, and I think that's going to create the right momentum uh, within the investment community uh, in regard to long-term uh, investing. Yeah, you know, uh, Frank, you know, I've been trying to get you here uh, to signal for some time. I'm, I'm not thinking this almost looks like a setup because we have you right after David here. Um, but the truth is, you know, you agreed to do this uh, before you knew about the announcement. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, you, you just found out about it. Um, so that hits you in a way that 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 you feel is a is a is a signal that could you know spread to other companies. Is that fair to say? Yeah, one hundred percent. And and I and I did not know about it, so I was, I was very pleased when I when I heard it and, and uh, uh, encouraged because uh, we need that kind of demonstration of leadership for this to work. Look, John, I think what's happening right now: uh, the most uh, advanced companies are moving are evolving from this idea of discovering their purpose, which is a necessary step. You have, you have to discover your purpose. Purpose is not invented. Uh, um, you know, it, it's actually revealed it's within the company um, uh, beforehand. That's the whole process you have to go through. But where the action is right now is how do you make that real? You know, how do you, how do you infuse it in a way that um, there's a consistent, sustained, act, sustained action around your purpose? Purpose and action is the next step. And when you see a step like this where – p and goes beyond, you know, the, the, the baseline of, um, you know, the science-based targets for reducing green, greenhouse gas emissions to going to these, these kind of natural uh, climate solutions. That's a commitment that is much deeper than I'm just checking a box to try to appease a, a certain segment of our stakeholders. It's rooted in what you really believe. Um, there's no reason for them to take that action unless they actually believe it's something that's consistent with their purpose. And again, I think that's the, the, the phase we're in now in terms of 
It's purpose-driven leadership and purpose-driven companies. It's how do you move from understanding what your purpose is to how do you make it real within the company? I'll say one more thing that I think is critical, and, and, I, and I heard a little bit of this in your conversation um, earlier. The, the, the key unlock to all of this is not putting posters around your office. It's not, it's not running a sizzle video. It, you know, it's not the perfection of the purpose statement. The key to all of it, it actually is having your workforce, each employee finding a personal connection into your purpose statement, into what the purpose of the company is. They have to find that, that, that connection point so that they actually feel energized by it and they have a sense of fulfillment and that they, they understand how they're contributing to something larger than themselves. It's the only way to bring it to life because you know, the CEO can't do it, the CMO can't do it, the C, CFO can't do it alone. It requires the entire workforce to, to row in that same direction so that you start to gain more momentum, people understand what you stand for, why you exist in society, but they can see it on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Now, uh, allow me to, to pivot to your to, to your role at, at BlackRock. You're, you're the chief marketing officer, and you have quite a storied career. Um, you've been at, at, at a number of, of well-known brands, including Pepsi. Um, but here you are, the, the, the CMO of BlackRock. You've got a huge platform that, you, uh, that you're about to roll out in January with Larry Fink's letter. Um, uh, it's going to be all about climate sustainability and purpose, uh, and then the pandemic hits. Um, how did that? How did that impact doing your job and rolling out this communications and marketing strategy? Given that, at least for the last four months, as much as we have seen that climate and sustainability are definitely inter, you know, woven with the pandemic in important ways, how, how did you keep that? keep on message or did you pivot message and and where are you heading next? Yeah, look, I mean, I I think this pandemic, like most social crises, um, they reveal underlying tensions that already exist within society. And and this one's no different. Um, And so the environmental crisis that we're we're all facing um, continues to exist. But the the COVID-19 pandemic illustrated that the the, the fractures within, uh, among groups within our society, the inequality, racial injustice, um, you know, those actually feed everything. You know, um, you know, so if you, look, if you look at environmental sustainability, the impact on underserved communities and communities of color is much greater. You know? um, and, and so that, that reveal for us, what has changed is we are still committed to and we will aggressively pursue our agenda in sustainable investing. And sustainable investing includes environmental. But I think what we're seeing is the rise of the S, of the social factors. And, uh, and you know, that's something that we did not anticipate doing in 2020. Uh, we certainly had it on the agenda, um, but we've accelerated that. Um, we've already done some of it right through diversity and inclusion, but we have to now go squarely against it. You know, issues like wealth inequality, race and inequality, uh, uh, L- LGBTQ rights, these social factors are all rising up very, very quickly, and, and we intend to address that. Um, the good news, John, is that the, they're, they're, in, they're related to the other factors. You, know, um, you can't separate wealth inequality from environmental issues. Um, they are deeply interrelated across regions of the world, uh, and de- depending on what side of it you're on, you know, in some cases, local communities um, they, they sustain themselves off of generating lots of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you have to address that because uh, if you pull that out, you, you're actually uh, devastating that particular community. Right. But you also have some communities here in the United States, um, particularly black and brown communities, that suffer disproportionately from the effects of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And so it, it's all connected. Um, what I'm most excited about is this is that um, I feel like everything I've done up until now has prepared me for this. I've always considered myself a purpose-driven executive. You know, when I was in the entertainment business, I, I looked at that really as purpose of bridging gaps between cultures. You know, Motown and Def Jam was that. Um, uh, in 2007, uh, at, at PepsiCo, Indra, Nua, Indra Nui announced uh, performance with purpose, and we were trying to focus on how we transform that portfolio. You know, at BuzzFeed, we try to pull marginalized people onto the center stage 
so that we can shine the light on them and show the dignity and, uh, uh, of, of, of those groups and those individuals. And I feel like it, that all has culminated into this, where I think the connection between wealth and well-being, uh, between uh, this whole idea of financial well-being, is now ready for prime time. And, and it's, it's our opportunity to step forward. And we can look at that through the dimension of sustainable investing. We can look at that through the dimension of climate change. We can look at that through the dimension of, of, of social change. Uh, and for me, I, I feel like my entire career has prepared me for exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's exciting times. I'm curious, given all the changes in the media landscape, which we discussed yesterday with Linda Yaccarino, Rich Greenfield and others, you know, how has that changed your job as a communicator at scale with BlackRock? So, so, so you, you, I start with this. I, I actually, and, and I know a lot of people say this and, and they don't really mean it, but I actually really mean it. I love change, you know, um, because with change, you have the opportunity to, to, to be really creative and, and, uh, and actually uh, change the rules yourself. And so for me, the, the way, it, the way I look at it is that the traditional interruptive advertising model has been eroding for years anyway. Uh, and, and, and John, you know this better than anyone else. The internet was not built for advertisers. That's not why it was built, um, but it's built for communication. And so the question is, how do you want to communicate to people in ways that add value to their lives? And so what I've been trying to do is shift our spend toward content that actually enhances people's experience. Uh, so we've developed a newsroom internally. We are, um, we've developed original content. We've partnered with companies like Indigenous Media where we are, we're doing 60 second documentaries. Uh, we still do some advertising, but highly targeted uh, and, and data driven. And so, so there's still a role for advertising. Uh, we put it in a much more limited space. It's highly targeted, it's data driven, but we're really focused on what are the content and experiences that we can develop either on our own or in partnership with others that will enhance someone's experience uh, um, uh, rather than interrupt it. And so I'm excited about, about that opportunity. And it's not for me so much about spending less money uh, uh, on a particular platform. It's not about that at all. I just want it to be more effective. I want, you know, I want it to be consistent with what's happening in culture and what people's expectations are. You know, if we take ourselves out of our daily role and, and look at what do you really enjoy? Most of us don't enjoy being interrupted when we're trying to find something online. You know, most of us right. don't enjoy being interrupted if we're having a conversation with a friend. Um, but if you add value to that, uh, we actually enjoy that. And so I think it's a huge opportunity. It requires a shift in thinking uh, for marketers, for, for for media buyers, but also for the platforms. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that this shift is happening because we're all trying to do the same thing, which is be more effective in communicating with the people that we want to engage with. Well, Frank, I, I have to say it's it's great both to have you at the helm of the of the marketing organization there at BlackRock and to have BlackRock as an ally in this shift that's happening inside of corporations around the world. So thank you so much for bringing your voice to Signal. I thank much you for appreciate having me. I really appreciate it. All great right. See you. Take care. Thank you.